So this will be fun. This is a fun one. Yeah, I've been mucking around with my setup. My prep was if I could strip the room out and start over again, how would that work out? <laughs> so it's great. It's exciting. Just put um, in the chat, folks, where you're from. Indonesia on there and Switzerland, Germany. We've got Slovakia, yeah. Australia, Florida. That's where I'd like to be. Ghana, Argentina, Spain, Latvia. Nice. Iraq, Italy, Estonia. Uh, I, think God, I think we've got one person in every country. <laughs> so for those of you that have not seen us before doing anything, uh, I'm Warren and I'm based in Australia in Brisbane. I'm a color grader and uh, I've also been in running or co-founding iColors with Kevin since 09, I think, Kevin, yeah? Yeah. What's that, 13 years? So, yeah, so we run colorist training, personal training, one-on-ones, and we've also got Color Space Get X, which we do something like this, very laid back and chatty where we get guests on once a month. And uh, next week, we're talking about IBC, about the whole show, about Amsterdam, about the experience and the kit. So that's always on a Thursday, UK time, 7 p.m. Uh, what about you, Kevin? What have you been doing? As I was saying, I've really been working a lot with the onset crew, DPs and, cinema, and um, DITs on, on color management. Then there's a couple of train, big training programs coming up. And uh, I've got a couple of grades, hopefully by before the end of the year, that um, um, one, one's a very interesting documentary and the other's uh, an indie feature. So I'm looking forward to those as well. I should probably introduce myself as well. I'm Kevin, the other half of co-founders of, of iColorist. Um, I'm currently the president of the Colorist Society, which is an international society. I'm also head of color at Mission, um, and uh, that's as well as doing the constructor work at um, iColorist and uh, grading for Final Color, so it keeps me busy. Yeah, nobody has one job anymore, do they? No, no. Um, they all you started used to have one job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you used to go home. You know, that, those are the days when you had a home to go to. You know. Well, yeah, it was always late though, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we're going to be joined so, uh, um, later in the program by Robert Wanat, uh, who's a staff researcher at um, LG, and his work revolves around creating models of the human visual system that simulate visual perception and how it's affected by the changing viewing conditions. So exactly what you need to be thinking about um, when designing a grading suite. And we're also going to be joined by CJ. Is that correct? Yeah, CJ Dobson. She's a great colorist, a friend of mine from Melbourne, Australia. So just about a 20 hour drive south of where I'm sitting here in Brisbane. I'm in Brisbane, she's in Melbourne. She's just set up a, a room. I'm not sure what she's put in it. So it'd be interesting to see how she's gone about setting up her room. Now, I know a lot of you are here just to listen to Kevin and I tell jokes, but you're also keen on winning a monitor that I've heard uh, LG are kindly giving away because they're sponsoring this session. And you can win the uh, ultra wide here, which is the 40 inch that I'm using as my GUI, my Resolve GUI. You will win that. There will be questions at the end of this show uh, based around what we talk about. Uh, don't worry, the questions are not too hard, but you will have to pay a little bit of attention to win it. So and there's a link a in the chat. There's a link in the chat. So you need to um, register if you want to enter the competition. Um, and you can find that in the chat and um, just put your name forward to win that monitor, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, I think it's fair enough. If LG want to give you a monitor, they need to collect your email address and a little bit of details about you, uh, which is fair enough. I think I think they're uh, they're a great crew. They come on board sponsoring iColorist, and they're making a bit of a push into the pro monitor market with their OLED pros, like what I've got here. And the the they come on board and they've got some interesting ideas, and so we're partnering with them to make this webinar. So Kevin. Um, what are we what are we basically going to cover here we're going to talk generally about setting up a room in terms of uh is it all about what color we paint the wall or we're we talking about other things uh certainly what color we paint the wall more importantly what lights we put in there is part of it but we're going to be covering budgets we're going to cover layout 
Um, and of course, a good bit about choosing the monitor, but also what other equipment you've got to put in there. Um, calibrating, um, working with clients, all those things. And of course, feel free to post questions in the chat and we'll get to answer as many of those as we possibly can. Yeah, now that's your real room. You're sit sitting behind you there, isn't it? They're your big result panels I can see there. You know I don't use those big, nice result panels. <laughs> so anyway, so you're you're going to run some slides and I'm actually going to move around because this is not a background. This is real. And I can hit play and the pictures should move. So I think if you go through and do some of the slidey stuff, I can comment. Then we'll come back to me and I'll walk around and physically go, there's my wall and hopefully you can't see my air conditioner up the top there. And we'll go like that. Yeah, I think it's a good way to go. That works. Yeah, that so works for me. You wanna... Yeah, the first thing up is what um, what do you think about when you're designing a suite? Um, how do you budget it? Um, how do you uh, how do you put it together? Where do you start? Um, and to a certain extent, some of that's going to be fairly logical. Uh, you've probably got a room in mind. Um, that that's a good start. How big is the room? We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the, in the webinar. But I think the first place that you want to start when you're designing a suite is what work you're going to do. Have you got clients? Um, I've, I've had a couple of uh, encounters with, with people that have said, oh, I'm going to buy you know, a huge fancy projector. Um, and I'm sure that I'll get lots of work if I put in a, a you know, really nice projector. And I say, look, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, putting in fancy equipment isn't what brings the work in. You're the, you're the one that brings the work in. So when you're designing the suite, it's good to look at what work you're already doing, what contacts you already have, what clients you already have. Yes, you can certainly take on more work, but don't think of the room as being the, the main draw for work. You build the room to suit the clients that you have. And then what I think you need to do is you need to think about how can I upgrade that room as my portfolio grows, as my client base grows, and as the budgets grow. Uh, so the sort of things you're going to need to look at are the environment you're trying to create. So is this a place where you mostly work alone, or is it a place where you might have one client? Or is it a place where you have a whole agency of clients, 10 or 12 people? Um, everything in the room is really re re revolving around the monitoring. So back when I started, we always used to refer to the reference monitor as the God monitor. And that's still how I think about it. It has pride of place in the room. And you're going to be sitting uh, directly in front of it. There is a... There are, there are some people that, that have it um, slightly offset so that you and one client are sitting there um, at a good viewing angle. And that, to a certain extent, will depend on how good your viewing angle is. You need to be close to the monitor. So the recommended viewing dif distance for a monitor is about two and a half times the height or one and a half times the diagonal. Now, on a 32-inch display, that's about 48 inches, that's about four feet. So you can see Warren um, would be a lot closer than that. And in my room, I'm about two feet away. So the recommended viewing distance of two and a half times the height is really where your audience are gonna be. And usually the colorist is gonna sit about half that distance. And that's so that you see absolutely everything, um, you know, all the errors, the dead pixels, everything. Okay. That's a bit of a subjective thing as well. And it's an individual thing, isn't it, Kevin? Really, how, how close you want to be. Some people will definitely sit nearer. Others will go back a little bit more. And that obviously incorporates your sound. So it is a, we say two and a half, but, you know, it's really subjective up to you. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's whatever you're comfortable at. You don't want to be so close that you can't really see the image. You don't want to be looking at pixels but also you don't want to be so far back that you can't see the pixels. You know, you, you've got to be able to see individual pixels. So that, that's the rule. Um, the next thing I look at is the desk. So if you've got big panels like the, like the ones behind me, 
then you're going to need a bigger desk. And remember that you're also going to need a keyboard. You may want um, scopes and things. You're definitely going to need um, at least one GUI monitor. Um, so make sure your desk is big enough and decide whether it's going to be on one level or two levels. Uh, the grading panels should be directly in front of the monitor. And usually I recommend to people that the user interface is to one side. So I, I don't normally go for a, a symmetrical arrangement. I like the scopes and the GUI to be one side, the client to be the other side, and then we're focused on the reference monitor, the God monitor. You need seating. So remember, you are going to be sitting in that chair for a lot of hours. Don't skimp on the chair. Get good support yeah. chair and you want something good for the client as well um, because an uncomfortable client is never a happy client. You're going to have to look at calibration. No matter how much you spend on the monitor, it still has to be checked and calibrated. Um, so that so that that can be cheap and it can be expensive, but you have to think about it. And then you're going to need a sound system because when it comes to doing the approval, you're going to want to um, hear the sound as as best you possibly can. You're not necessarily doing sound approval, but you need to see the sound married to the picture, and you need to get um, you know a good uh, surround system uh, to do that. Depending on on what market you're in of course yeah I, I i agree with that one i often think um when you start playing back the show married with the sound quite often the clients mm. start talking about the sound which that takes the heat off you because they're not worried about the pictures they're discussing the sound so and always the pictures look better with sound as well when you're running them down it gets the client the overall feel now, if you've got bad sound or something's wrong, it's going to distract the client. So the best you can make that, uh, the better for yourself as well as your clients as well. So I think that's a, an important one that people do tend to overlook. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't skimp on the sound. Let's talk about the equipment in that room. So we've talked about the environment a little bit. Um, I, the one thing I didn't talk about was paint and bias lighting. So we'll come back to that. Um, and I'm sure Robert is going to have a lot to say on that as well, because that's his, his speciality. Um, okay. So in terms of the equipment, this is probably the area that, um, I think people get, um, most confused. Let's, let's say, it. let's say confused. Um, what do you need? And this is where your budget and your market come into play. Remember, most of all, what we want is something that we can upgrade. So whilst you can set up these days with a, a decent laptop or an iMac, those are not very upgradable. And very quickly, you're going to come up against limitations. And then the cost of solving those limitations is going to be a lot more than if you build something um, a bit more modular. So you're going to need storage. You're going to need um, a fair amount of storage, but how much you need will depend on whether you're doing music videos or two minute YouTubers, or whether you're doing a full on feature film in 4k HDR. Um, so your storage is going to vary from, um, I would say a, a small home raid or NAS to a full on SAN. Uh, and, you want to you need, you need to have fast storage, right? So we're talking probably about SSDs for the most part. Um, and the, the trick there is to make sure that you've got enough because um, you can always expand that. How are you going to connect that to the computer? Um, if you're on a Mac, then Thunderbolt is very popular. Um, if, if you're on the um, on the Windows side, then there are several options on, on my Windows machine. I've got um, cards that do NVMe directly in the machine, which is enough for me uh, as a working cache. And then I connect um, externally to a, to a RAID after that. So that's your storage. That connects to a computer. Is it Mac or is it Windows? Um, there, there's going to be benefits to both. Uh, it could be Linux even. Um, it, it doesn't really matter for our purposes what the computer is. What does matter is how much processing power it's got, um, and specifically the GPUs. So you, 
if you're doing 4K and above, you need quite a lot of video RAM, and those GPUs are expensive. Um, they've got they've come down a little bit since the bit mining thing um, has has eased off, but you definitely need um, a decent GPU, and you're probably talking about, I would say, in some cases, as much as the computer for the GPU. Uh, because those GPUs are going to give you your real-time playback and, and your instant response on the control panels. Then you're going to need control panels. They don't have to be the um, full-on advanced panels that each of the manufacturers um, sells. Uh, you can get away with um, a small tangent panel. Uh, you can get away with the, um, you know, Blackmagic have the mini and micro panels, fantastic value, um, and they work really, really well. But you do need panels. Um, when people call me up and say, oh, can you come and do a grade? And I'll say, well, what panels have you got? And it's, oh, well, we've got um, you know, a, a laptop and a mouse. Well, I'm sorry, but it's, it's not a matter of ego or, or anything else. You simply cannot make adjustments with um, a mouse or a, or a pen because you can only slide one parameter at a time. When we're working on the control panels, and you might have your hand on one of the um, joybles and another hand on, um, say, an offset knob, an exposure knob, or something like that, you're typically moving um, but anything between two and six controls at a time. And you need to do that in order to see where the image is going. It's very hard to create something if you have to do it um, sort of dot to dot. So control panels are an essential, and you have to do, um, you have to choose what you have space for, what you're comfortable with. A lot of colorists nowadays are using add-ons like stream decks and loop decks that they can program to suit their their way of working. The next thing that we need, and which is absolutely crucial, and this is the thing that people often try and skip on, is a video card. So. It, it sounds obvious, but you've got to have video out of the system. Now, most systems allow you to see an image in the user interface. Some of them even allow you to have um, desktop uh, expansion and put a full size image on the, on the second desktop. The trouble with that is that it's under the control of the operating system and not under the control of the grading system. So for a fully calibrated color managed workflow, you must have a video card. Now, the good news is that those start at about 100 pounds and they can go up to several thousand, but um, they, they don't need to be expensive, but you have to have one. You cannot rely on not having a video card. Can you make it work without a video card? Yes, you can. But in my opinion, the amount of effort and work you have to put into it and the pitfalls and the times that it's going to be wrong don't really justify it from a business point of view. Right? Yeah, so, so it's a good, good investment to get a good video card, get the best you can. And again, think about it. It's all very well buying the cheapest one on the market, but is it going to do HDR? Is it going to do 4K? Do you need to do 4K? Um, because you're going to, you don't need two video cards. You can get away with two graphics cards, but you can't get away with two video cards. So um, that's a place where you need to think where you're going to spend your money. And then we come last, but most important of all, to our friend, the God Monitor. And again, the, the God Monitor is going to be a choice of what is your market? Are you, are you only going to be doing internet or television? In which case, you know, Rec 7 and 9 needs to be perfect and you don't really mind about the rest. But are you going to get into HDR? Even if you're not doing HDR jobs, is it something you see on the horizon that you need to learn about? So if you can't see it, you can't play with it. Um, what, how are you going to connect to it? Is it going to be HDMI? Is it going to be SDI? One thing that people forget to look at in the reference monitor is how easy is it to use? And again, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, I, could, you know, I can get a decent television these days, and it will calibrate perfectly in Rec. 7 and 9. Absolutely right. Is it easy to use? Hell no. <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of time um, trying to switch stuff off. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to avoid things like um, 
local dimming and so on. Um, and if you do need to switch between different color spaces, then it's going to be much harder to do that on a television than a monitor that says, are you looking for Rec. 709? Are you looking for DCI? Um, are you looking for um, HDR, Dolby Vision, HLG, you know, whatever it is. Um, so the reference display needs to be perfect. It needs to calibrate. You need to know how you're going to calibrate it. Um, but it also needs to be easy to use. And the number one rule that I've always looked at is what's the point of the God monitor? Well, it is to get perfect pictures, but it also has to represent what people are going to see at the end of the day. Right? So there are some very expensive, excellent reference displays, which are nothing like what we see in our homes. Um, and that, again, is something that you need to consider. Am I looking for the perfect reference or am I looking at what people are going to see at home? And one solution to that, of course, is to have two displays. So we can we can look at that. Oh, Mike, good. Just let's just backtrack. I think a big thing that people overlook is the room environment. We really don't realize how much our environment affects what we see on the display. Hence why we normally have a neutral gray behind the monitor. We have uh, a D65 light source coming from underneath. Any lighting in the room should be at D65. We shouldn't be turning to our clients and we've got a complete red wall behind us. Even things like brightly colored sofas and things. All of those things impact how we see. We then turn to our reference monitor and we see a slightly different color. So we're impacted by a lot of these things. And this is important. And sometimes I go in rooms and I'm thinking, really? You've got that there and you've got, you know, wrong color temperatures in lamps and all sorts of things. And they're pretty basic things that you can do, you know, and just getting right sort of paint color here for behind there, setting those sort of things up uh, is an important thing. I think that people, people tend to forget those, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, which is a good lead into um, Rob, I think. Talking about environments. Rob, are you there? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Hey, Rob. How are you? Thanks for joining. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me, guys. Hope that's all right. Well, and it's a good time, I think, while you're on board to say that LG have got a, two new displays coming. A 27 and a 32, a BP95E, which has a hood, and it also has self-calibration as well. And they are will be available soon, not at the moment, but that's new lines that are coming out that's newer than the OLED Pro I've got here. Rob, where are you from? Just uh, tell us what, you, what you're about quickly. Uh, I'm currently in San Jose, working out of the Santa Clara office for LG. Right. Okay. Lovely. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, see some of your presentation. In this presentation, I'm going to talk really quickly. Before I talk about how to calibrate the display, I'm going to talk how the calibration doesn't really tell you the whole picture about the capabilities of the display. So I'm going to focus on some specific technologies. What I'm going to be talking about applies to all display technologies that you can encounter in on the market. But on the next slide, you can see that. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on LCD, LED, and about OLEDs, simply because they exemplify this, what I'm talking about the most. So these kinds of displays are going to uh, use different kind of emission technologies. So for example, with LCD, LED, we have two different emission layers. The first one is the LED backlight, and this one uses a certain number of LEDs, which is definitely much lower than the number of pixels in the LCD panel to illuminate those LCD panels, this LCD panel, and then we have the LCD panel that forms the final picture. And the whole point is that every single one of those LEDs emits a cone of light, and that cone of light is going to illuminate multiple LCD pixels that are then going to process that light to create the final image. So what you can see in the next slide is what this results in is uh, the backlight creating image that looks like image A. It's a very blurry, low, con I mean, high contrast, but uh, low resolution kind of image that only contains the specific illumination for 
distinct areas of the image. And then in the middle, you can see what the LCD panel is showing. So the LCD panel typically does not have the greatest contrast, but it can uh, produce very high, uh, very high frequency, so a very high resolution image. And then when you combine the two together, the backlight illumination and the uh, LCD image, you get what's happening on, in the rightmost image, which is the combined result, which you can see the shadows are looking much deeper than in what the LCD can generally do. Uh, the highlights are bright. So we generally end up with a nice looking picture. However, if we go to the next slide, we see that this only works uh, for specific types of content. So if we look at the uh, source image, which is in this case a scan line. So basically, this is just a step edge, a step from a dark pixel to a bright pixel and a checkerboard, which is the same signal, just multiple different multiple changes from bright to dark. And we can see that the backlight for the step edge is resulting in something that's causing uh, the blurry image that is somewhat, uh, it's not exactly as sharp as the image that we want. So we're going to have some undershoots on one side and overshoots on the other side. So we're going to have to compensate for that on the LCD panel. And as long as those zones between bright and dark are large enough that we can mask them with the LCD compensation, we're going to have a nice and sharp edge. However, uh, if, we if those zones uh, that where the light is changing are much smaller than the individual illumination zones, we're going to end up with the backlight illuminated pretty uniformly. It has to illuminate all of the pixels in the same way to achieve those bright highlights. But at the same time, because of the uh, limited uh, contrast of the LCD panel, we're going to lose a lot of that contrast. So you can see on the bottom for the checkerboard, the image doesn't look exactly as what we expect it to look because um, even though uh, we have those individual light dimming zones, they cannot really function properly if the content is too small. And you probably, a lot of people have seen it, even working with professional displays, you might have noticed that for some of them, you try to show something like a star field and you're noticing some halos around them. Those halos are the expression of exactly the problem I'm talking about. If you're using an LCD back illuminated panel, just not enough dimming zones. So this is actually a, pretty complex problem to solve. Uh, in the next slide, you can see that, for example, the OLED doesn't really have that issue because each pixel is self-illuminated. So either you can have RGB pixels in some OLEDs. So the monitors that you talked about a moment ago, the LG EP950 and the BP950, those two use RGB OLEDs, so self-luminous, each pixel is lit up independently. It doesn't rely on any uh, surrounding pixels to be lit up or not. And the same thing applies to RGBW. These are the consumer grade. The only difference is that uh, those have an added white sub pixel so that the display can go brighter, but the technology works the same. So this is a, an effect, the difference between the self -lum luminous pixels and the back illuminated LCD the difference in color reproduction that this introduces, the halos around the bright objects surrounded by dark, area, dark areas are actually quite difficult to predict. So I'm not gonna go into too much details over here because uh, this is something that um, is, uh, has actually been a part of research. So in the next slide, what you're gonna see is that we actually have a paper in the pipeline right now uh, that is going to be published at SEMPTE conference next month. We're going to be talking specifically about that, about how to measure those differences introduced by the different display technologies on the quality and the accuracy of the image that you're reproducing. So even if your display is measuring perfectly and is calibrated perfectly, you still might be getting some inaccuracies and how to measure those inaccuracies is the goal of the paper. So now in the next slide, I'm going to be talking about the um, calibration. So starting with the next slide, which, yeah, how to calibrate your display. Uh, we're going to be talking, starting with uh, the optional step, which is colorimeter calibration. If you, you want to have definitely at least a colorimeter, that's the minimum. So the BP950 comes with a built-in one. Uh, otherwise, you can buy some cheap ones off of Amazon, I think, uh, I want D3 colorimeter costs about 150 to $200 right now. Um, 
if you also have access to a spectrometer, you will want to also do, do a calibration. So a lot of those colorimeter manufacturers allow you to calibrate the colorimeter specifically to the display. So uh, if you have the possibility of doing that, do it because it is definitely going to improve your uh, results. If not, just skip on to the next step. So I'm going to be showing the, in the next slide the calibration software that we're going to be using for the 32 EP950. However, we modeled it after Kalman calibration. So if you rather use Kalman, which is another professional software for calibrating displays, you're going to notice that there is huge similarities between those two because they are meant to look very much the same. If you are using the EP950, you can download the software for free. Uh, you can use the um, you can use the either uh, the QR code on the screen or the link, download it, and you can calibrate your EP950 same day. Okay, so let's start with the next. Uh, let's go on to the next slide in which uh, this is what the um, the calibration studio looks like. This is what you're going to see when you start up the software for the LG calibration. And uh, after it connects to the PC over either a USB-C or another cable, it's going to take a few minutes, download all of the information about the display, and then it's going to show you the main um, UI on the right. So if you don't have a colorimeter connected right now, you uh, it's going to ask you to connect one and then select it. And if you're okay with the default settings, you can just press proceed and go on right now, start calibrating. But if we go to the next slide, if you, if you want to calibrate different modes, because uh, that's the thing, you might want to calibrate different modes for different use cases. You might have one deliverable, which is Rec 709. So you want to have a separate calibration for that, another calibration for, for P3D65, and then have a separate calibration for that. In this case, you either want to switch the display mode to the correct mode that you're going to be using and wanting to calibrate. Or in this case, in the calibration studio, you can just choose it from a drop down list on the top of the screen. And you can see, you can choose picture mode. Any of those picture modes you load is going to automatically choose that mode on the display as well. So that you know you're calibrating the correct mode. And another important thing is that, of course, you can calibrate to the default settings like Rec 709, everybody knows, is D65 white point. But if that, for whatever reason, doesn't work for you, you can adjust all of the settings. You can adjust the peak luminance. If you prefer SDR, which is not 100 nits, but 200 nits, you can adjust the white point chromaticity. If you prefer a slightly different one, EOTF color primaries, as long as you remember what the calibration is, that's the most important thing. And then after you're set and you're happy with the settings, just click proceed. And uh, the next step is, of course, setting up the, um, the measurement. So over here, the setup that we use just to demonstrate to you how we've done it is using a laptop connected to a CR, uh, photo research uh, CR 100 colorimeter. On the right, you can see the CR250 spectrometer, that is the spectrometer that we used previously to calibrate the colorimeter for the specific display. So in the next slide, you'll see that once we click on proceed, typically the software is going to give you a chance to aim the colorimeter specifically at the area of the screen where you want to be doing the measurements. And after the alignment, uh, turn off the lights because you don't want any screen reflections. Uh, you can move on to the next step, which is in the next slide, the measurement. So during this step, you're going to be seeing, uh, th th it's going to be fully automatic, both in Kalman and in the LG Calibration Studio. It's just going to go through a lot of color patches, measuring them. And on the right, you can see what happens on the uh, attached laptop screen. It uh, tells you that in 34 minutes, it's going to finish uh, calibrating. It gives you the information on the bottom of the screen, what you're currently calibrating to. We can see we're calibrating P3, D65 to gamma 2.6. Uh, OK, so in the next uh, step, you can see that after those 34 minutes, you are going to be faced with a calibration report like this. It tells you. Yeah, in this case, we calibrated to P3 D65 mode. So uh, of course, P3 D60, DCI P3 is mapping to 48 nits. We got 47, so which is uh, very close. The color temperature is also very close to 
what we expected and gamma is again almost perfect so if you're happy with those results you can finish now if you want a bit more information about what actually is happening you can also click on the validation button and in the next slide you're going to see that the validation button again lets you choose beforehand which mode you want to validate so you can also run a validation without running the calibration first and then afterwards in the next slide you can see that after a much shorter time this time it's going to be about 15 minutes you can get a report like this which measures across multiple grade patches multiple color patches it measures the different um, uh, primaries and you can see the results uh, in terms of delta e so you can see that the calibration that we achieved in this case is on average about 0 0.31 delta e 2000 so in this software specifically, we support Delta E94 and Delta E2000. So this is a pretty good calibration, I would say. And this is, you can uh, see that after you finish the calibration. So on the left, you can see, if you look at the P3D65, you can see that it doesn't mention anything about the mode being calibrated. It just listed as P3D65. On the right, you can see that following the calibration, it tells you that the mode has been calibrated. So you can trust that uh, this is the mode that you have already calibrated. You don't need to calibrate it again for in the nearest future. So that's all for calibration of the SDR. The HDR works exactly the same. It just gives you a few more settings. So in those settings, you can adjust also the clipping point for the uh, EP950. So we can set at which point it starts the roll off, at which point it starts rolling off more and more. And uh, yeah, but other than that, once you click proceed, everything works exactly the same. So it's yeah, great. That and is this, this is free software, Robert. This is free software. You can download it right now. And what operating system is it available on? It's available on Mac OS and Windows. Great. All right. Good. Well, th thanks very much. Thanks very much. So mm -hmm. are you working on a lot of secret stuff you can't tell us about, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, mo mostly that paper, that was a, a huge amount of work, but I'm hoping that it's going to be very helpful to the community to understand good. how how to work with their displays. Well, it's good to see that LG are making a real push into the pro market, and which is which is great. Thanks very much. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yeah. also, I mentioned not, not just us, also with collab the paper is in collaboration with Disney, I should also mention. So it wasn't just okay. us. We great. don't get all the credit. Yeah. I've yeah, no, I've heard of Disney. Yeah, they, they'll go places. Uh, CJ, how are you? So, so last time, yeah, that's great. Looks fine. So last time I saw you, you were in the process of, of building a, a new room or a space or rooms. Uh, just tell us, yeah. tell us a bit about the process. Well, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. We, uh, we aren't quite there, but we're close. We've moved in. One suite is set up. Um, essentially, I'm setting up a facility that's uh, available for other artists as well. So it's not just for myself, but it's also a dry hire facility. And they're two finishing suites. Um, and I can I can turn the camera around and yeah. show you the space. Uh, yeah. So it's a little bit of a work in progress. Like I said, we're still still a few things to be um, tweaked. Hang on, camera. And you're in uh, you're in Melbourne. I just explained to people. All oh, right. Yes. So this is and our um, suite that we're in currently. You can tell the monitor's way too far forward because we're we're waiting on a hatch here. But this monitor. Okay, you're running. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to come back, and then it'll yep. be far enough away because currently it's way too close to the operator's face. Yeah. Um, here we have a window which is unusual for a grading suite, but we ha also have yeah. a blackout blind, so this fully goes to black. Oh, um, with these nice. channels down the side, as you can see. So, very important to be able to black out the light. Uh, neutral lighting, which is dimmable, and each of these globes is a smart globe, so we can calibrate them to be the right. Color temperature. Right. Got gray walls, which have been matched yeah. to our little gray color cards. So yeah, <laughs> oh, very nice. Good. So there's a little bit of a hack and an LG client reference monitor. 
Uh, okay, yeah. so you've gone for the client on the angle for the clients. And yes. that do, can you so that yeah. means you've got eye line to where they're sitting if they're on that sofa? Exactly. Is, I yeah, I like that. It tends to be most artists' preference, um, in that you don't have to sort of um deal with clients doing a com comparison between your broadcast monitor and your client reference monitor as well. Yeah. Um, yes. if you've got them in eye line, it can be a a little bit problematic they'll sort of start uh, nitpicking the differences i'm i'm not a fan of the big uh the big panel up above the grading display that you see in some rooms uh, that's traditionally with the sofa behind so where i'm sitting here some people will have their they'll have their lg up the top there and obviously yes. their argument of the client can look over the top you can turn around but i find it gets in my eye line a bit and I'm seeing yeah. it and it's distracting me. So I'm not a fan of that. I like, I like the setup that you've got there on that angle. How did you go about matching the two? You think you've got those pretty close to so the questions you're getting back from your clients. You're not looking at your, your hero display and going, mm, I don't quite see that. It, it takes a while, doesn't it? It's uh, it's very, very close. I have to admit, I do outsource my calibration to someone else, but we get it super close. Yeah. And then uh, if I notice, usually I notice things in the red, um, I can by eye just tweak it just to get it how I feel like it's a little closer. Uh, but you really only notice those small differences when you're working on something with a like a less range. So a solid color, or uh, you know, there's less dynamic range when there's when there's a lot of kind of different colors in the image and contrast in the image. You really don't see the difference in the calibration. It's only those sort of few projects uh, where it will come up. And if if someone comes around to my screen, by the time they walk around and look at the client reference monitor, you can't like your eyes are already adjusted, so there's no issue there. Yeah. It's only if it's yeah. side by side that people get yeah. start to um, yeah. panic and. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Now, here's a question that comes up. So you grade everything a bit like myself, from features to commercials, music videos, documentaries. Mm -hmm. Do you change your lighting environment, like the brightness of your room, depending on what you're working on? Absolutely. I'm a big believer for TV. You don't want to be in a dark environment. Um, in fact, I will sort of start a grade with the lighting at the level we're supposed to sort of have it and, and increase it if I feel like maybe the client's starting to get a, go a little bit too dark. Uh, particularly for day for night scenes, if we're grading TV and we're doing a day for night and they're in a dark room, the, you know, the temptation is to go far too dark because your eyes adjusted to that level. Uh, if we're doing a short film for feet, sort of for cinema release, we'll start in the dark. But again, I'll always watch it with them with more lights on in the room so they get an idea of what it might look like if someone watches it at home and you know in a, in, in a brighter environment well that's that's the really hard thing now isn't it because we're not i mean we're grading a feature like i did quite a lot of indie movies right and so yeah they will go to the cinema but you've got to look the bulk of where that movie's going to make its money is probably going to be on one of these or an ipad where people are not necessarily setting in the dark mm -hmm. So right. the, the, the question comes in, and I think you've sort of got to balance it around and because we're only making one master. We're not saying we're making heaps of masters here. We're doing one grade, one grade fits all. And so I think generally the, we're used to grade in the dark all the time going back. I mean, that really happens now. Uh, we sort of hit the, the brightness of the room around the middle somewhere, I think. So I think that's yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I suppose with most features that I work on, at least we do get a chance to do a trim pass. So we're doing it. We're doing going from P3 theatrical down to two Rick 709. Yeah. Uh, and I, yes. I won't grade that in a dark room. If I, if I'm freelancing, right. I'll take these tubes around or something like this. Yeah. yeah. And just create some light because it's. I just think it's crazy to be grading TV in the dark. You've got to not just transform it into Rick 709, but you have to kind of make it so it's viewable <laughs> yes uh, yeah for, for people yeah. yeah so so in your room and your setup there if you're grading a feature and obviously you're grading on your monitor and it's a movie and you're doing a p you're doing p3 on the monitor and you grade really dark 
Um, we yeah, we we have P three on us. We also have HDR on this monitor, which is exciting. We've got the um. Oh, very nice. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a beast, but uh, yes, if it's for P three theatrical, we'll start in the dark and then transform. It depends. Sometimes it's not. Uh, budget for a transform so you mightn't do it that way you could just do the whole project and wreck 709 and then yeah do yeah it transform exactly after. yeah the one mark the one master fits all thing that's really good what uh, other considerations in building your room did you sort of have to think about did you did you have it all mapped out and drawn out before you even started or because you've obviously worked in a number of places so you must have had a fair idea of what you wanted to do and I, I'm trying I suppose I'm trying to say you've got to get an idea of what you want budget it out first and then get it on paper and go can I make this work before you start obviously yeah absolutely and because I've freelanced for so long I know sort of how exactly like what um, setup works best for me particularly working with clients and so that's why the desk is facing this way because it's for me this is the best that was important to me to be able to sit separately to the clients and not have my back to them. Um, so I needed enough space for that. This was a complete blank canvas. There were no walls. I, this was all, all been built uh, for it. I've also created, I'll turn the camera around again and show you the entrance because the, the, the entrance is pretty fun. We have a, a screening light. This whole, this whole hallway can be darkened down as well. We've got more blinds. And then we have yeah. these lab signs and screening signs so that people don't come into to the room during a during a screening. But oh, the right. idea is that this darker area means that there'll just be like a little bit less light leak coming into the the suite as well when people are coming in and out because you can be in the middle of a play through and someone opens the door and all the light floods in and you have to start again. So, so that was another consideration. Uh, obviously lighting the windows for me. So often we get put in, the, in a dark hole, but um, if I don't have clients and, you know, for some of the work, for some of the sort of short passes, I can have the blind half open and just get some natural light in as well for my, my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right we've got some questions coming in for you cg uh, somebody's asked what were those lights those portable lights that you you showed us what, what explain oh, yeah. what you do with those again uh, again they just those? um I'll, i just got these on b h they're just daylight balance 6500 you can um these are nan lights and they're portable and chargeable and for me because i particularly in commercials uh, I use these to light products. So right. I'll put a, like yesterday I was doing some Kalua, a Kalua commercial. So I set this in front of the bottle of Kalua just to make sure that I could see how the colors would sit properly. Um, so yeah. I, I that's a good, that. that's a good idea. That's a good tip. <laughs> did, did everyone get that folks? Yeah. Make sure you light the product properly so you know exactly what you're, what you're trying to match to. It's often, oh, Chair malfunction. Who said you needed to buy a proper chair? He's that was very important. This is this is also a it's standing only two foot shorter nice. than when I yeah. came in. Um, <laughs> uh, ergonomics. ergonomics we got, is very, very important. We've got some other questions. Uh, mm -hmm. How does LG range? This is more of a general one, I suppose. Fit into the general. Uh, for me, for the SDR market, it's certainly definitely in the conversation with your other usual players of monitors. And I think also for, for HDR, it's a great monitor for testing and playing with HDR, and which you've got to do as a colorist. Now, you've chosen an LG for your client monitor, yeah? Correct. Yeah, as, was that a, a consideration or is that? pretty i would say pretty standard in australia for what people are using for client monitors displays is that right absolutely it's definitely a standard um i'd say most shops have an lg client reference monitor uh i'm also i often recommend it for clients when they're asking me what tv they should have at home uh and i'll tell them you know get an lg get filmmaker mode and then i feel a little bit more secure that what they're looking at at home because that's important. Like I heard you say earlier, it's important to know what your user is, or the end user is going to be seeing. So for me, it's it's one of those things that I recommend people um, 
get it, get it home. Now, question, I think, Rob, about pricing. Am I right to say if people are interested in the prices of the LGs, they go to the local LG website in their region and then can find prices and dealers from there? Because I know people are asking a little bit. Is that the, is that the right way to go? Yeah, I mean, reach to your local professional distributors, not necessarily even LG. Uh, it could be, I don't know, B&H uh, in, um, in California or in the United States, just uh, wherever you would get your professional monitors, reach out to them and, and they'll have some. And, and I was checking, them. I was checking just earlier, um, like in the UK, you can buy them on Amazon and they're really, they've really come down in price. They're very affordable <laughs> right now. Actually, I was just at IBC, and at IBC, you can buy them in the equivalent of Best Buy. You can just go to the store and just buy them off the shelf. So, yeah. Oh, good. Good. We'll we'll have to use that info in our Color Space Cadets episode next week. Yeah. Indeed. We're talking about IBC. Yes. Good. It team. is a bit of a game good changer team. because um, although these monitors don't get the no OLEDs today hit one thousand nits. But honestly, the contrast ratio, and, and CJ was talking about um, working in a bright room. One of the things I really like about the OLED panels is that you get good blacks even with the room lighting up. Whereas with a lot of the um, LCD panels, if you want to see good blacks, you really need to keep the lighting down for that reason. Um, so that contrast ratio is, is very important for me because I think it's closest to what people see at home. But yes, there is uh, an issue of the 1,000 nits for mastering as well. Uh, let's do one more question because I know everyone's desperate to get into this quiz. And trust me, it's going to be a good quiz. Uh, size of monitor for grading, uh, CJ. Y you've got, I'm going to say, a 32 there for your main grading reference monitor. Uh, was that... A, obviously a consideration that you've wanted something a bit larger than conventional 25? Yeah, de uh, definitely moving away from HD and into more 4K, having a bigger screen is helpful, but also we, we just didn't have the option with the HDR. This is, this is it, you know. Um, yeah. But certainly a lot of studios are still using the, um, the smaller screens. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah, I, fine for HD, yeah. SDR. Yeah, I mean, LG have got the new 27 and the 32. I would say if you're building a room, you definitely want to stretch the extra money for your mm -hmm. for the 32. Because yeah. and I've, I've said this before, like when, when Kevin and myself were young, we used to grade on big, like Sony tellies, but everyone at home had a small telly. So they'd come into our room and go, wow, that's a huge TV. Now they come into my room and they go, wow, I've got a bigger TV at home. Like, <laughs> that's how much it's, and it's true, they have, doesn't they? It's yeah. true. I think the viewing, yeah. the viewing distance is important too. Um, mm. And, you know, the, the big TV that you had, you know, 20, 30 years ago was still only 24 inches. So we've actually got a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. But I find that a 32 inch, you know, half the audience viewing distance is about two feet. And I find that to be quite good. I find if I'm on a 27 inch, I feel like I have to get a little too close to it. Um, and I don't like that. And of course, if you go for the bigger monitors, um, you know, 55 and up, then you're actually sitting quite a way back. You need that to be on a wall mount and, and that's a whole different, you know, getting your neck in line and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So somewhere between 32 and 42, I think, is actually the sweet spot for a desktop um, grading reference monitor. Yeah. So long as I think you've got enough distance between you and the screen, I think if it's too close, um, the 32 inch maybe could be too big if you don't have much space on your desk. Yeah, and that's it. Big space on your desk, especially running these panels. You can see I'm, I probably could do with a little extension on the back there just to maybe get that guy back a little bit more because I can't move this one this way. And these panels are quite deep. But these are all things you can sort of work out. To, to move that back is not too much of a deal. And the distance behind the back of my monitor, the wall, is, is probably normally about two times, probably. Not so important, but it is important to light up that wall because the idea is 
you can obviously look away or look into space and you get a neutral reference coming back at you. And that's the idea of doing that, to get that like that. Okay, I think it's, uh, we're getting near giveaway uh, quiz time. Uh, there is a link where you can register because obviously LG wanna capture a bit of info about you if you win and they need to get you your prize. And we're gonna run this, it is multiple choice. So I think it's time to, uh, to run the quiz. Here we go. Oh, we're off. Okay, here's the first question. What's the name of the reference monitor that Warren uses? The reference monitor that Warren uses. How far should you sit from the monitor? I, I think it's the height of my face, Kevin. I've got quite a, a wide face, not a high face. You must have a very small monitor then, Warren. Uh -uh. <laughs> so if you're listening carefully there, what are the newest models of the LG Ultrafine monitor with the self-calibration sensor? Oh, the tension. How long has iColorist been teaching color corrections? Right. And a whole bunch of other things too, by the way. Yeah, all sorts. 20 years. I don't think we're old enough for that, are we? Here we go. Biggest box office movie was Top Gun. What was it shot on? What was Top Gun Maverick filmed on? Great movie, you've got to see it in the cinema. Good advert for getting back to the cinema, I would say. We have a winner. Justin. Where, where are you from, Justin? Put your name, put in the chat there, where are you from? But I'm, still dark. Uh, I'm working on color grading, basically, so I really need this monitor so much, especially this ultra wide features, it's very cool. And I'm also using uh, DaVinci Resolve, even my camera is uh, black magic, so it's really very suitable for me. And oh, great. Yes. I, I can talk. I can speak. I'm so happy. <laughs> good, good. That's, that's, that's yes. what we want. We want someone who's, who's going to be pleased. Oh, there you are. There you are. Thank you. Well done. There you go. Look, you've even got, yeah, yeah, got other, everyone's in the room congratulating you. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, thank buddy. Thanks so for much. joining. Uh, that's fine. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Rob. Thanks for joining, Rob. Great insights in what LG are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. That's all right. I want to thank CJ, uh, my fellow Australian. You, you, got a, you got a great, what are you grading today, CJ? You got a big day? You're on mute still. <laughs> I muted it again. Um, it's a public holiday, so no grade today. Oh, it's grand final for you guys down there, isn't it? That's it. And yeah. when's your opening party? Did I miss my invite <laughs> for that? We haven't we haven't set a date, but I'll send you an invite. <laughs> excellent, when we do. excellent. I love I love your room and I like what you're doing, and it's great to see people setting up new spaces and you know just pushing the envelope of color correction. That's great. Um, right. Well, thanks for having me. That's all right. Uh, here we look like we've got a little bit of uh, back info on LG. Obviously, you, I think you can register interest if you're interested in, in buying the newer displays that are, are coming out, which is the, the BP950Es in the 27 and 32. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Always a pleasure, mate. Mate, great work. I'll see you on Thursday, 7 p.m. UK for Color Space Cadets. Color Space Cadets. Um, we'll, be, we'll be chatting about uh, Amsterdam. What and, went on uh, in IBC? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. It's been fun. Thanks to LG for, for sponsoring. Thanks, everybody. Ciao.